Township Board meeting for July 11th. If we could first start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we start with public comment, also we do have Clerk Brooke is out tonight, so if we have a motion for someone to take on the duties. Sir, I, I make a motion to uh, appoint Treasurer Keeps. Take the minutes. Support. Motion by Trustee Shosak, support by Trustee Barnett. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. You ready? It's not. <laughs> All right. So we'll open up public comment. If anybody has anything to share, you can just step on up to the podium. Okay. All right, we'll close public comment. You got off easy tonight. <laughs> all right, next we'll go on to approving the board minutes of June 27th. We've all had a chance to look them over. If there are no changes, I'd look for a motion. So moved. Motion by Trustee Murray. Support. Support by Trustee Burnett. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. Great, we'll move on to the fire department promotions of lieutenant and firefighter emergency medical technician positions. <clears throat> and we have Chief Leroy. Good evening. Trying to delay here because uh, all of a sudden the calls came in and certain people haven't gotten here yet. <laughs> um, tonight's a fun night in the fire department. Um, we get to do some swearing in for our probationary firefighters and then a prom promotion for one of our lieutenants. Um, if I could have Bob Gallo please come to the front please. <coughs> I'm extremely proud to announce that firefighter paramedic Bob Gallo has been promoted to the position of Lieutenant. Lieutenant Gallo brings 20 years of experience, strong character, integrity, leadership, and dedicated service to this new position. He has been actively involved in many department programs and projects, including maintaining and purchasing of all the fire department turnout gear. Lieutenant Gallo's promotion will ensure the department continues to excel and will provide the township an excellent officer who will make sure we continue to execute at high, high levels of service our community expects. With that I would like to have Kim Gallo come up and place the badge on Bob's chest. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> With that, I'd like to present Lieutenant Bob Gallo. <laughs> Should say, um, <clears throat> Thanks, Chief. You're welcome. With that, if I could have firefighters Ryan Doomsa, Joe Evangelista, CJ Dagger, Charles. Andrew Fleming, Brett Syracuse, Luke Mackin, and Madison Van Heck, please come to the front. All of these probationary firefighters are at various stages of their probation, <clears throat> all of which includes many hours of training and uh, from either basic EMT all the way through their firefighter for, uh, trainings and everything like that. You can get on camera better. <laughs> <laughs> Camera's up. <laughs> there you go. Firefighter Ryan Doomsa came to us. Uh, he has a very different story. Ryan has an undergraduate degree from Michigan State University and a master's degree in accounting from Walsh College. After deciding that that career was not for him, Ryan completed his paramedic certification and attended the OCC Fire Academy. Ryan recently completed his first year of probation, probation and became a full firefighter. I would like to congratulate Ryan on his first year and invite up his wife, Heather, to come pin his badge on his chest. Thank <laughs> you. 
So just to enter in a little bit here too, if you notice there's some silence from up here. Um, Clerk Brooke is in here to do the administering of the oath, so they will be official. Um, <laughs> so we didn't want to miss out on the families who had planned to be here tonight. So that's why we're still going through with all this, but they will be official by tomorrow morning. Yeah. I'll have uh, a member of the clerk's department will come down and administer the oath at the morning meeting for all the personnel at their individual uh, morning meetings. <clears throat> Firefighter Joseph Evangelista. Joseph came to us from the no part-time from the Novi and Commerce Township Fire Departments. He currently just completed his first year of uh, his probation, and he is currently completing his paramedic certification and the final steps of that through the Genesis Hospital Paramedic Program. I would like to invite up Stephanie, his fiance, to pin his badge on. Charles Dagger, he came, to, he came to the Bloomfield Township Fire Department after first serving his country in the United States Navy. He is a graduate of the OCC Fire Academy and is currently enrolled in all, nearing completion of his paramedic certification in the Dorsey Paramedic Program. I would like to invite up his wife, Catherine, to pin on his badge. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> That's a multitasker. <laughs> oh. Andrew Fleming first served in the United States Army prior, prior to coming, becoming a Bloomfield Township fireman. He is a paramedic prior to being hired by the Bloomfield Township Fire Department, and he attended the Oakland Community College Fire Academy this past year, coming in this last fall, fall. Fire Marshal Vlahos will be pinning Andrew Fleming's badge. Probationary Firefighter Brett Syracuse. Probationary Firefighter Syracuse started as a Bloomfield Township Fire Service te technician right out of high school. He is a graduate of the OCC Fire Academy and is currently completing his paramedic program through the Macomb Community College. I would like to have Fire Inspector Lieutenant Joe Syracuse come up and place a badge on his son. <laughs> yep. You you're gonna do <clears throat> Probationary firefighter Luke Mackin became a fire service tech while com completing his undergraduate degree at Oakland University, which he just completed. Recently graduated from OU and he is currently enrolled in the Genesis Hospital Paramedic Program. I would like to have Fire Marshal Vlahos pin Luke Mackin's badge on. Probationary Firefighter Madison Van Heck started as a fire service technician with the Bloomfield Township Fire Department 
with the fire, prior to attending and graduating from the Oakland Community College Fire Academy. She is currently enrolled in the Genesis Hospital Paramedic Program, and I would like to invite her father, Battalion Chief Alan Van Heck, to the front to place a badge. <coughs> <laughs> Please congratulate all these probationary firefighters and, and recently completed <laughs> firefighters. those oaths administered later in the week. <clears throat> group shot of everybody together? I'm gonna bring them all up because we're gonna, I'm, the one award that we do have, um, most of the people in this room are deserving of. Nice. So if everybody could please come up to the front and uh, file in behind them, you'll understand why. <clears throat> It's a little bit different tonight. Normally we, we have a lot of awards, um, but the firefighters didn't do a very good job this year of promoting themselves and letting us know what they've done. <coughs> <laughs> but the one award that they do get, or will be receiving, are uh, most of them were in a, a part of. So, um, at 7.38 in the morning, on September 8th, 2021, a residential structure fire was reported in Station 3's area. Due to the shift change occurring at 8 a.m., members from two separate shifts responded to this fire. Upon arrival, Station 3 found a two-story dwelling on fire with neighbors on scene reporting that they believed the residents were still inside the house. Fire crews split up into a different teams to, to both fight the fire and search both upstairs and downstairs of the home for the residents. Under extremely stressful and very difficult hoarding conditions, fire crews found residents in two separate areas of the home. The victims were removed from the fire quickly and transported to the hospital. For these quick and coordinated actions, giving these residents the best chance of survival, all members involved with this fire are awarded the newly created unit citation. Firefighter Scott Collins, Firefighter Jake Pache, Firefighter Joe McGrail, Firefighter Patrick Quinn, Firefighter Scott Edgman, Lieutenant Brandon Gaynor, Firefighter Alec Ree, Firefighter Jason Clunan, Firefighter Chu Yang, Firefighter Matt Zito, Lieutenant Ed Leitz, Firefighter Robert Nichols, Lieutenant Tim Cower, Battalion Chief Kevin Cardinelli, Firefighter Michael Best, Firefighter Jason Clunan, Lieutenant Bob Gallo, Firefighter Jake Kreitzer, Lieutenant Kevin Schutte, Firefighter Corey Van Heck, Firefighter Ryan Swatala, Firefighter Joe Evangelista, and Firefighter Brad Woodhull. Congratulations, everybody. So we have a tradition in the fire department. In several years ago, we created what we called the Iron Man Trophy, and it was later renamed the Mike Cummings Iron Man Award. It was created to recognize the firefighter paramedic that responds to the most emergencies during the calendar year. And it used to be, you know, a couple hundred calls. You know, we used to make fun of it. No big deal. It's. Lately, it's gotten to the point between overtime and everything else, the number of calls is really astounding what these individuals respond to in a year. The winner of the 2021 Mike Cummings Iron Man Award for the most responses in a year is awarded to firefighter Chu Yang for responding to 718 responses. This is 122 more responses than the 2020 award winner and it is the most incidents responded to since their creation of the award. 
firefighter Chu Yang, would you like to come up? We had several emergencies happen this evening about 15, 20 minutes prior to the award ceremony, so everybody was running around scrambling. <laughs> Congratulations, Chu. Firefighter Corey Van Heck here. Please come up. <laughs> no, he's not in trouble. <laughs> this time. The Mike Moore and I Care Award. This was in September of 2020, then Township Supervisor Leo Savoy created the Mike Moore and I Care Award and Fund. Donating money the Bloomfield Township Fire Department charities for a monetary award to benefit a member of the Bloomfield Township Fire Department that goes above and beyond to help a resident of Bloomfield Township. As former Chief Mike Morin would do on a regular basis. Later in October, a Bloomfield Township family suffered a devastating house fire. After the family began to recover from the loss, they came to the fire department with then Supervisor Savoy to express their thanks for the way the fire department treated them during and after the worst day of their life. Along with the, the thank you, they delivered a check for $10,000 to the Bloomfield Township Fire Department charity, earmarked for the Mike Moran I Care Award. The Bloomfield Township Firefighters Charity has decided that a total of $1,000 a year from this fund will be awarded to a member or members of the fire department that go above and beyond for the residents of Bloomfield Township. On July 14, 2021, after rendering care at the scene of a medical emergency, this firefighter took it upon himself to remove a fallen tree for an elderly resident and EMS patient. The tree and branches were blocking all access to the resident's front door. Upon the resident's release from the hospital, he returned home to find that his existing problem had been mitigated and all evidence of the tree had been removed. When he contacted me the following week, he was still at a loss for words, and the actions had been taken to help him out. It is with great pride that I announce the first ever recipient of the Mike Moore and I Care Award, firefighter Corey Van Heck. That we have tonight. No, it's not. <laughs> uh oh. It's not. <laughs> like I can have John, Le Chief John Leroy, come up to the stand. Oh, great. <laughs> we have one more. On the morning of Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, Chief Leroy was at work but wasn't feeling that great. So he decided to go home and get a COVID test. A couple of hours later, he heard several sirens nearby and quickly learned that there was a school shooting at Oxford High School. For those of you that don't know, Chief Leroy lives right across from the high school. His wife is a teacher in the community and his kids go to those schools. Um, upon hearing of the shooting, without hesitation, Chief Leroy headed towards the school to help. Uh, he also served on the fire department, so he knows a lot of the members there. Uh, upon going to the command scene, uh, Chief Leroy was advised and directed to go to the command post. He then was told to team up with some individuals inside and begin rendering care. All right. Um, he then went inside, rendered care for the victims. After he completed his assignment, Chief Leroy went back to the command post and then spent several hours helping direct um, everything that happened afterwards. All right, for his actions, Chief John Leroy is going to be given the Meritorious Service Award. For John's sake, we'll go ahead and, it, that's the end, right? Okay, for John's sake, we'll go ahead and say thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate you and everything you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you for that.
What a nice surprise. Yeah. Okay, it's hard to follow that one up, Noah. But uh, <laughs> uh, tonight we also have next to consider the awarding of the contract of the 48th <coughs> District Court Rooftop Unit. And tonight uh, Katie is out, so we will have Noah Mahalski. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for, for coming. Here. Good evening. Uh, here to um, get approval for a uh, recent bid item for uh, replacement of a uh, rooftop unit at the 48th District Court. I uh, just want to remind the board that the relationship with the 48th District Court is that we're a landlord and they're a tenant within the courthouse, so we own the building. As part of the lease agreement, which was uh, renegotiated in 2016, we have responsibility over replacement of HVAC and mechanical items within the facility, and they have responsibility for maintenance. Um, and so there were twin units on the uh, courthouse, on an addition to the courthouse that were installed in 2001. Uh, and ever since 2016, we've been planning for the replacement of those units. Um, one of the units had a compressor replaced like four years ago, so that's why that twin unit is not being targeted at this time. The one we are targeting has had an increase in maintenance costs significantly over the last, since I was in uh, building maintenance in 2016 and up through now, there's been increasing costs and uh, repair issues with that unit. So we went out to bid for the unit on Mitten. Uh, we had three bidders that came back. Um, the um, There were good responses, but the, one of the uh, Guardian's response was significantly lower. There's reasons for that. They are the current PM technicians for uh, the courthouse and for their units, so they have intimate knowledge of the workings of the building and the uh, physical characteristics of the unit, that type of stuff, logistics required. Uh, so that's why we believe it resulted in the lower cost, which is significant, I think it's around $20,000. Um, difference there and we kind of wondered about that at the outset so um, but due to the significant increases in maintenance costs and the life expectancy of the unit which is 15 years typically you start looking at planning to replace these uh, I recommend we award the contract to Guardian Environmental in the amount of 107444 or 441 uh, to replace the rooftop unit at the courthouse have any questions? I just had uh, just a comment. Sure. Um, I know that there's been significant uh, repair costs over the past uh, few years, and it's certainly not enhancing the life of the uh, of the units. So they're just keeping it going. So you know, I rec I suggest that we go along with your recommendation because we're just throwing good money after bad right now, and uh, with the new units expectation what 15 or 20 years 20 plus you know they do keep take good care of them over there so it'll be a 20 year lifespan 15 20 year lifespan we'll get out of it um, and again due to the preventative maintenance that, that, that goes on over there and I will echo that there's been at least five or six uh, repair requests and downtime since December uh, for this unit uh, the three-year history is pretty impressive as far as the number as well and we have to there was nobody in the buildings for two years and there's very limited people in the buildings now. So I think they would have had, you know, people just didn't notice that things weren't working uh, when they weren't in the facility, you know, and they were not being used during those two years. I mean, that courthouse basically shut down for two years during the COVID, so, and they're just starting to get back to operations, so. Yeah, um, is this gonna get put in this fiscal year? Yeah, it's budgeted for this fiscal year, yes. Budgeted, is it budgeted out of the equipment replacement fund or is it budgeted out of No, it's out budgeted of through there, through the department. Through the it was a planned, this is part of the planned stuff. But it's part of which? Capitalized part? equipment, just like a plow truck. A piece Not of. Not our specialized fund where we have for surprises. This is out of the normal. But, it, but it's not, it's not the court line item. It's, it, there's a correct cap, capitalized cost line. Yeah, correct. Okay. General fund capital, yes. Okay. 
Anyone else have any questions? And if not, I'd look for a motion. We'll make a motion. Motion by Trustee Barnett. Support. Support by Treasurer Keeps. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. And next we have uh, some visitors today. And we have Oakland County Water Resource Commissioner's uh, Office presentation on the Evergreen Farmington Sanitary Drain Drainage District. You always have the longest <coughs> ones. <laughs> Corrective Action Plan. We have first Olivia up here. And then we also have uh, Jim Nash uh, from Water Resource Commission. And I'll let you introduce the others as you come up. <laughs> Hey, yes, we like uh, acronyms in the world of engineering and water and wastewater. Um, so tonight uh, I'm here uh, just for to introduce the Water Resource Commissioner's Office and as uh, Supervisor Walsh mentioned, uh, Co Water Resource Commissioner Nash is here. Um, and just a quick refresher, which was included in the board packet uh, in the memo from me, is uh, about a year ago, the Board of Trustees approved the Evergreen Farmington Sanitary Drain Drainage District uh, agreement. And that agreement uh, converted the Evergreen Farmington system into a Chapter 20 district. Several benefits to that, including um, that the uh, Evergreen Farmington sewage Evergreen Farmington Sewage Disposal Drainage District is governs, uh, governed under three elected officials known as the Drain Board. With that agreement, it included the next phase of a capital uh, of projects required uh, that the township shares in uh, for a regional approach that are required through the township as well as the county's administrative consent order. Uh, so that, at that time, the agreement included the estimated project cost total and the share by the township. Since then, the Water Resource Commissioner's Office has continued um, more formal design and review, and that project cost has increased. So I asked the Water Resource Commissioner's Office uh, team to come and review that and explain that to the board. So I will just turn it over to Commissioner Nash and um, take a seat. Does somebody want to operate this? I'm not speaking long, so whoever's going to be running that, they can. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm Jim Nash, Water Resource Commissioner. I'm here to um, answer any questions, make sure that uh, anything you have questions, anything that you need to know um, is answered before we leave here. And um, I, But I'm not the expert. These folks are. So I'm going to let them take over. Uh, I just want to mention I have Evans Bantios. He's the project manager. Um, uh, Rafael Chirola does all our financing, all our economic stuff, so he can answer those kind of questions. Um, and uh, this is uh, um, Sid Lockhart, who is my one of my managers. He's in charge of all CHOP projects, special projects, anything to do with that. So I'm going to start out with him. Okay. Thank you. And I'll, I'll take a high-level summary, then we'll get to our consultants here. We have Tim Miner from Applied Science, and then Maria Sudke, our design engineer. And Tim has been with us for a long haul in every environment, and going back years as far as planning and moving the DEQ and different projects along the way. So they have all the answers Commissioner Nash does. But at a, just a high level, what had happened was we went to this project with an assumption that our existing pumps would work. And then there's all this project cost that was based out of that. And then when we got into it, started actually testing, testing the pumps, it turns out they, they, they weren't going to work. They weren't going to meet the new system requirements. And from that, this, the things dominoed because the electrical got bigger, didn't fit in the building, had the new electrical. Pull, we had to pull a generator outside to make room for the electrical because you had to keep this station going while the new one gets put in place, the new, the new pumps at the same time. So it's not we're building a new one in a field somewhere. We have to keep the system running. And it's a terminus of, I can't remember the residence, is it 80,000? 80, 80,000 like 80, people where this terminates this pump station, so we have to keep it moving. So that's what caused all the spirals to happen for the, pr the price we once thought it was going to be. And those dominoes factor that, then the increase in um, supply chain and those kind of things. But there's details and slides, and I'll let Tim and Maria yeah. go through that. And Tim has a lot of history how we got to where we are today in this project even. So he'll go a little background on that. All right, good evening. Thank you. So Olivia and Sid did a great job giving an overview. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a, a little bit further back and talk about how we kind of got to where we're at and what the need for this project is. So there, there are sanitary sewer overflows. Like Olivia said, we have all sorts of acronyms. This is one of them, SSOs, and those are illegal. This is places where the, the capacity is exceeded and, and, and raw sewage exits the pipe and, and in, enters the environment. Uh, certainly not something anybody wants to have happen. Uh, so Evergreen Farmington uh, itself and certain communities have SSOs within their systems. 
uh, and EGLE, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy has uh, issued administrative consent orders that say y you must correct this issue. So that, that's where we're at today. And th this is not the first order. Actually, Evergreen Farmington has a, a variety of legal instruments dating back to the mid 1980s <coughs> saying you need to correct these issues. And they've been working incrementally over time for the most economical solutions to correct these. And, and now we're finally at this ultimate solution of, of the project that we're going to describe today. So uh, the, the projects that we're going to tell you about today will bring us into compliance with those ACOs. Uh, and and the, these are the same projects that were in that, that 471 agreement that you saw about a year ago uh, when the, the Evergreen Farmington drain was formed. I should have said before I started talking, we're going to give a lot of uh, content. If you have questions, feel free to stop us. We're happy. We don't, this isn't a necessarily a presentation. Uh, we can answer questions along the way. So uh, a little more detail on the projects that, that we're talking about. So uh, this, is, this is a corner of the Evergreen Farmington, and the, the corner that, that this is in is predominantly Southfield and the surrounding communities. Uh, you may be wondering, wondering why I'm showing you this, because we're here in Bloomfield Township today. Uh, that's because the, the projects are occurring uh, in, in this corner of the system. Uh, they're what we call end of system projects. These, this is the area of the system that everybody's flow ends out at. So uh, all the way from uh, Kegel Harbor, West Bloomfield Township, uh, parts of Auburn Hills, Bloomfield Township, Troy. It all comes to this point, and then, then it gets discharged to the Great Lakes Water Authority for treatment. So uh, collectively, all the flows that those communities input to the system are resulting in those SSOs. So we're solving this outlet pro project, uh, problem together. Uh, a number of communities, including Bloomfield Township, have their own ACOs, and they had opted years ago to band together, recognizing that it would be much more economical to solve these problems together than for everybody to solve their problem individually. Uh, so uh, the, the projects that result, they're a little hard to read here. Let me see if I can zoom them in. I don't know if it'll zoom in up on your screen. There we go. So uh, there, there's some that we call the WLPS1, Corrective Action Plan, CAP. Uh, so this is a, one of the, the overflow locations uh, where uh, there's a pump station, w Walnut Lake Pump Station 1, that uh, will get overwhelmed and actually get shut down in certain cases, and overflow will generate from, from that location. Uh, there's also a number of projects. Let me zoom in on this area. There we go. Uh, there, there are more towards that outlet, uh, including the, the Lather Village Corrective Action Plan. Lather Village is one of those communities with ACOs, so there's some specific projects that benefit them and benefit the system happening there. And then the large project that Sid was referring to and that Maria will be giving a lot more detail on is the uh, eight mile conveyance and Great Lakes Water Authority capacity project. So this is the upgrade of that part of the system to deliver more flow from within the Evergreen Farmington to the Great Lakes Water Authority for treatment. See, I'll go forward to the next slide. So th this is those same projects uh, presented again in a, in a table. Uh, in, in this table, we're showing the, the we're calling corrective action plan component because they're we're running these all as kind of individual projects, but they're really part of an overall plan uh, working together. And then their the current status, estimated costs, and when we might anticipate final costs. So the the, the first project on the list is that eight mile. Uh, sewer conveyance cap, uh, which is currently estimated at $83.6 million, uh, followed by Lather Village at uh, $1.7 million, and that Walnut Lake project is, is currently estimated at $5.1 million. Uh, I'm going to note that this one is in pre-designed data collection, so it's probably the, the least developed of the ones on this list. We're just getting into to some field work to, to learn more about the, the needs there. Uh, the next one is, is uh, uh, not a physical project, but it's a negotiation with Great Lakes Water Authority for additional capacity. And the, the fee that was negotiated is, is about $38.2 million. Uh, still final, being finalized. You can see summer 2022. So yet this season we're expecting to uh, finalize that. And then uh, there are some program costs to administer this uh, at about $3 million for a total of 131.6 million dollars. 
So I think at that point, I'm going to yep. pa pass it off to Maria. Do you want me to keep running the slides for you? I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Yeah, we'll do it. Good evening. Oh, it is. So um, the biggest projects, as you can see, what is the eight mile sewer conveyance project. And um, real briefly, what, it, what the intent of it was is to, there's a, the sewers, 16 sewer on eight mile here kind of shown in um, yellow. It's, it's a gravity sewer. The pump station upstream of it right here. Can you see my mouth? No, you can't see me. There's a pointer, pointer up there for her, Olivia. There. Got it. I think we can make it into a pointer. Now, I now we can see it. All right, great. So the pump station is up here. This is the eight mile pump station. And all it does right now is lift the flow up and then dump it into the gravity sewer. And the gravity sewer pumps uh, just sends it all the way down to the Great Lakes Water Authority GLWA system. So the intent of this project is to increase the capacity, send more flow, and therefore reduce overflow, reduce SSOs by sending more flow through. To do that, the intent is to change this gravity sewer into a pressure sewer. So if we can pressurize it, we can send more flow through it. That was the intent of the project. And to do that, the intent, what we were gonna line the sewer. If we can line it, make it pressurized, then be able to pump more flow through it. That was the original intent of the project. But by making it a pressure sewer, all the sewers that were coming into it could no longer come into it because it's now pressurized and tightened. So we were gonna build a gravity sewer, the orange that goes back, red one, takes that gravity, that flow back into the pump station and pumps it into the pressure sewer. That was the original concept of the project and that's what um, the original cost estimate was based on. Included in that was some work at the overflow chamber here and there's the discharge header from the pump station that we were gonna uh, abandon and change into a pressure discharge sewer. So that was the intent of the project, and that was the, the cost that you were provided um, as part of the original study. Once we got into design, as Sid mentioned, um, we, the first thing we did was looked at the pump station to verify that the pumps can pump the flow. Um, unfortunately, we found out pretty quickly that they couldn't. There's five pumps in the pump station, and right now, over time, they've kind of worn out a little bit, and they just could not pump what they were supposed to pump. So that kind of changed the concept a little bit. Uh, we now had to replace the pumps with newer pumps that could pump the flow. Um, there are five pumps in there right now, but they're varying sizes. They all pump different flows. By having to upsize them, we also now needed to put in a standby pump. So you'd, you, by Eagle standards, you always have to have a standby pump should one pump fail. So that's a new concept. So these are pretty massive pumps. So we now needed four new pumps. Unfortunately, by just going up that one pump size, the entire electrical system uh, was un became undersized. So we had to replace the entire electrical system, the transformer, the motor controls, all of that had to be changed. There's a big generator on, on size for standby. That became undersized. So we now needed a new generator. So all of that got added to it because of the pumps. Um, <coughs> to get the pumps in and out, the structure of the uh, facility, we had to do structural modifications. These pumps are too big to fit in the same spot, so we literally now have to uh, from, you know, put holes in the, in the floors of the buildings to take to, uh, the old pumps out and put new pumps. Also, this is a pump station that is um, operational. We can't just shut it down to replace the pumps. We have to replace the pumps one at a time. So what we have to do is take one pump out, put one in, let it run for 30 days, make sure it works, certify it, then go to the next pump. So we've now also added almost a year to the project because of the pumps. Um, so um, the other thing, this project was full of surprises. Uh, on Eight Mile, as we were looking at the design, we found a nine foot, nine and a half foot diameter abandoned tunnel in the middle of Eight Mile Road. That's in the way of our system. I don't know how a, a nine foot sewer gets Nobody knows about, but it's there. Um, so that's in the way, um, which made us change a little bit of the concept. So now instead of lining the pipe, we decided to build a new force main and p send all the flow through the force main because that pipe is just in the way and it just wasn't gonna work. Um, other changes, as we looked at the flows and the hydraulics, we realized originally we were supposed to line 
3,875 feet of pipe. Um, but as we look through the uh, hydraulics of it, we realized we had to extend it to 6,000 feet now. So now we've got a, you know, almost double the size of the force main. Um, the recirculation chamber um, just outside of the pump station, the, our intent was to abandon that. Then as we looked at the structural drawings, we realized it is actually holding up a corner of the building. It's part of the structural uh, of the building. So that had to be modified. So all of these things kind of happened during design that were not part of the original concept. So as a result, that what made the project price go up. Originally, this is a pretty complicated um, spreadsheet, but basically the first column here is the original scope that you probably uh, saw originally with an opinion uh, cost of about 38.8 million. Um, there's some modifications here, but these sort of even themselves out but you can see the big, big change is all this work at the pump station that was added in once we got into the detailed design that bumped the cost from the 38 to about the $83.6 million. Um, I know it's a lot of info. Any questions for that before we go to the next ones? Michael? <coughs> um, in the memo I'm looking at, it said that the original project costs were $72 million. And the new estimate is 131 million. Yes, this one's just one of those, though. This is just the one project that caused that increase from the one. If we go back, the sub project. Yeah. So ah. it's this cost right here yeah. that brings it to That's the one. That's the big deadline. driver. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So, in, in terms of these various pumps and the construction timetable, are these pumps? Um, uh, uh, specialty built or are they, pardon the pun, but on the shelf ready no, or? No, no, uh, they are pretty big, gigantic pumps that are, you know, unique. They, so uh, part of this project is the uh, time it will take to get these pumps built and sent to us. That's part of the, the, the cost is the, it's, this is now almost a four year project. Okay. Essentially, sure. in, all, in all these big infrastructure projects, the pumps, you have to make sure that the pump curve meets the system. We have the system curve, which is the demand, like the friction loss. We made the force band longer, so this, this head, this head. The pumps have to overcome that head. So certain manufacturers have those, and we spec those against each other, but then what happens is the engineers spec them, and then as we, we bid that out, then the contractor will provide shop drawings, because there may be four or five alternatives on pumps that had that head condition met, and this one, I don't know what the, how many there are, but. And then they put it, they're turning the submittal, then engineers check it and make sure the submittal matches, matches the spec, make sure it all checks out. And then when it does, it gets approved, then the contractor gives a green light to the manufacturer to manufacture it. And at that point, it's not getting manufactured, then it gets a production schedule. And then they come back and say, okay, now that we got the shop drawings and jimmy's done and then like Siemens or color hammer, or, um, what's some other big ones, Tim? Flight. Fairbanks. Like, yeah, Fairbanks, Morris, these big manufacturers. Then it goes in production, then it gets produced. And then if you take, that's one part of this thing, same thing happens on the electrical side. So all these things have to come together with their contractor as the design goes through, and they all have long lead item, essentially, to get built. Then it gets shipped, and then once it gets there, then the guys have to, or workers have to hook it, hook it all up, essentially. So ha have these been designed, manufactured? Not yet, they're still designing the project. Okay. But we, did, but we did hire Walsh Construction. We've, we've had a little bit of twist in our delivery system. Normally what happens in projects, you had designers design it, then you know they were for the county, then the county, the Commissioner National Office, we put it out to bid, then they get a contractor. Then that stuff doesn't happen until you actually get a contractor and all the submittals go back and forth. But we did it in this, in our prior, another project, we have a big pump station in Macomb, part of the OMID system over there, did the same delivery, we hired a construction manager we got them early on board working with our, with our consultants to do value engineering to look at some of this stuff so we have good estimates as we're going along this. But also we tasked the engineers to push forward the specification of the equipment before design is done. So then the construction manager can put it out the bid ahead of time. Otherwise you're waiting for the design, the whole thing takes a lot longer. So in order to fast track it, we had the specs push forward on the equipment before they're done designing the rest of the the, the building and the smaller stuff that's kind of insignificant that normally would cost you the time to have actually bid in the job. So we brought in a CM at risk, they call it, um, to push that process forward to cut down delivery time, to shave time and money off the project. 
So if you go back to the timeline, I guess what I'm get wondering is the longest lead time is basically a little over a year. Um, it doesn't sound like that kind of time is built into. So, that's just to get. That's just the cost. design. Those are to lock just to get the, button up the cost for you right. guys. Yeah, for instance, we just we just put a generator package out the bid, and I think the generator Evans is how many? Ninety six weeks. weeks for the generator, right. and that's okay. step one to get the old generator out of the building. You have to have a new one in place before it can go out. That's it. room for electrical. So since COVID and supply chain, all this stuff is getting pushed out, long lead times. And read the tea leaves, I think it's gonna get worse when all the infrastructure money hits, when they're still playing with the rules and all that. We're all gonna be chasing the same limited, manuf limited manufacturing base across the country, and I think it's just gonna get worse. So we're on the front of it right now. I think it's, I foresee it getting worse as time goes on. So in terms of a construction end date, what are we looking at? Uh I think we're, for this project right now, we're anticipating um, end of 2025, maybe spring of 2026, if all goes well. Yeah, usually by the time you say go on these things, it's three years. I mean, that was pre-COVID, like three years. By the time they design it, by the time you build it, if you're building new stations longer, getting out of the ground, and then getting all the equipment in and lined up. Yeah, but it's all custom order, custom machine fabricated, really nothing off the shelf. I have a question based off you mentioned the ARPA funding. I know we've reached out to the county asking how much of the ARPA funding will be put towards this. Well, how much of the ARPA funding is? <laughs> well, we've talked to them about it too. We don't have control over that, but okay. um, we, we're proposing projects um, basically as we speak. So we're looking at, uh, uh, this involves a bunch of communities. So yeah, it would, we're, we're very interested in doing anything we can to get these grants. Um, or low interest loans, but we'd rather have grants. Um, so that's what we're, we're, we'll be working on that tirelessly. I so, I'm sorry? Oh, we are getting uh, 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 these earmarks that, that the Congress has allowed again, which has been 10 years, more than that, um, has allowed us to bring in some grants. Last year we brought in several, this year we're working on even more. Um, so that's, that's something where we, we are not sure, we haven't heard back yet. No, we applied for a $5 million uh, earmark from Stavell's office, but it made the cut, so still getting, right. still pushing forward. So it's working on it, and we haven't heard back, but we should soon. It's actually within another month yeah, or so they, so, they should be actually advancing this, so they'll, we'll, they'll, they'll tell us as soon as they can. But uh, going forward from here, you know, I mean, the, uh, the infrastructure bill that they passed last year now, um, they, the, the Michigan uh, legislature hasn't even looked at it yet, so that's, that's money that's gonna be coming in in, in the following years. Um, which again will be will be as this project goes. So we're hoping to be applying to all these for for grants for all these kind of things. I do know both Brian and I have reached out to our commissioner Marcia, and she's been very receptive. So if there's any others you need us she's to reach out to, she's spoken to me about that. As a matter of fact, so <laughs> yeah, speak to all of them. So yeah. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know when you when you look at the communities that are impacted, you probably right. have almost half the commissioners in Oakland County that this impacts. Quite a few of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We went through them. There's yeah, a significant amount. I think it was amount. like 15 out of 21 or something, something like, like that. that. It was, it was significant. How we were. No, no, right. it's true. And we're, we'll be working on it. So um, as if any, anything you have a, you know, a lead that somebody is interested to you, let us know and we can, we can work on that too. So well, we, we, we'll be working on this uh, as we are on, on projects all over the county for this kind of funding. And how, how is, number one, we'd be happy to work with you and in concert of working with the commissioner. So we, we should talk about that. Um, how is the cost, how is our percentage broken out in this? We'll, we'll get us. We have some slides we'll on. Slide okay, we'll get to that. To yep. <laughs> Any other questions? Or so then just to verify, so when those dates were, that's you locking in prices so that you're not getting a part two years from now ed estimated and it's even higher. It's a progression. It's just but, but Walsh has a good handle on the estimate. We just had a 90, do we get the 90% estimate? Just to make sure we're clear, I am not related. Okay. Just, I just wanna get that out there in case anyone's listening. I am not related to Walsh Construction. <laughs> <laughs> so I <laughs> just wanna make sure that's out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sorry. Yeah. So they, they're, um, we just had 90% design plans that the team put together and then Walsh will give us an estimate off of that. But since they buy this work all the time, you know, they have a handle on how okay. much it's costing. So we're not expecting like big sticker shock after, you know, at this point. So it's like we're gonna bid the job and wham, all They'll this cost comes in. in. For example, we, uh, there, it's a progression. we had an estimate on, on a truck when we went to actually place the order, it was $300,000 higher. 
So are they locking in these costs for you? As, now? as okay. it goes, as a bid package, okay. they're going to break it up into packages as bid packages. First okay. one's a generator that Evans was chasing down right now with Walsh. Okay. So as the packages get developed, they lock it in. Yeah, then they lock it in. Okay. Yeah. So even if yeah, it takes 96 yeah. weeks. Then it's locked in. Okay. That's yeah. the locked in price you're referring to. Okay. So November this year we'll know exactly what it costs. But from now till then they'll be buying the job out in packages and okay. bid packages. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Good question. Go. All right. So obviously with the price going, you know, has increased so much, the obvious question is, is this still the best option, right? What we're proposing to do, does that still make sense as the cheapest, as most effective option? So we had um, previously to this option looked at an option of building storage. So if you can't send all the flow, all the extra flow to Detroit, the only other option you've got is to store it until the rain subsides and then send it, right? So but the key the, to for a certain rain event, the, yes. the key to yes. this conversation, well, yes. all for a certain design storm. Yep. Yeah, that's why, yep. So we had looked at putting a nine and a half million gallon uh, sanitary retention tank um, to store the flow. So the pump station is right here. So the idea was to put the tank right here um, in this sort of trunk yard. Uh, but with that, we'd need another pump station to pump the flow into the pump station that would then pump it through a force main to the tank. So it was a tank, <coughs> a pump station, uh, and, a, uh, <coughs> and the force main that goes with it. Um, the negatives of this one is um, obviously we'd have to purchase land to put the tank in. Uh, and this tank, given this next to junkyard, it did require some remediation. There was some contaminated groundwater and soil. So that would have to be dealt with. Um, also, now you've got two facilities to operate and maintain, you know, with equipment that ages, that has to be replaced, energy costs, manpower, all of that. Um, as Sid mentioned, it does have a finite volume, right? It's nine and a half million gallons. So if you get a spring event bigger than that, now what, you're still gonna have an SSO. If you fill the tank with a big rain event, but three days later you have another rain event, you haven't had a chance to empty the tank yet, you can have an SSO, right? So all of these are the negatives as opposed to just being able to pump the flow. Also, the higher capital cost. It actually, the cost of the tank um, is $107 million, plus, plus the land acquisition, plus remediation, plus everything, it reaches to $142 million which if you compare it. And just to add one more thing, the land acquisition is a kind number there because if you could get that land, the next best land was a mile away, I think. Yeah. So then the job was going a mile. If you couldn't get that piece of property, that's kind of rolling the dice on the land acquisition part of it anyway. So our project, is, if you remember from the previous, was 83.6 million. This is 142.5. Um, we still had the GLWA capacity negotiation, which was 38.2 million for our project. This one, we hadn't gone that far. We, we didn't negotiate what we needed because that project was too expensive. But it could have been anywhere up to the 38.2 million. So we never got there. We didn't know what that would be. So still, the eight mile project is still the cheaper project. Even though the price has gone up, it really still is the most economical. And uh, uh, capital cost as well, long term, because it's less facilities to maintain. And the buying the capacity really came late into the game. That wasn't even an option on the table as we went through like years of looking at projects. That was because they don't have it to sell. They're in trouble with Eagle or part of DEQ, and that's Gleewa or DBSD before that, the plant. They have their own problems because they don't really have capacity to sell. But I don't know if you saw this in the, in the it was, I don't know when it was reported, Jim, the press, press release you had on this. Mm -hmm. But it was really because of Commissioner Nash working with Gleewa and regional partnerships that um, it came to be in Detroit. Detroit want to do separation projects to get kind of low-lying fruit to get rainwater out of the system. So if Detroit could get money to separate that and take the rainwater out, then Gleewa's got capacity to sell. So it's actually a tripartite agreement between Commissioner Nash, Gleewa, and DWSD of doing that. So that, that money that's going to Gleewa is actually being paid to separate the system so our flow can get in essentially. So that's what the 38 million is there for. So the, what this deal does is it allows us to have all of us are, are presenting clean more water for um, <clears throat> for cleaning in the Detroit water uh, treatment plant 
um, while at the same time saving money. So we're not going to be doing this, you know, um, whoops, sorry. Marie uh, mentioned the, um, the, the operations and maintenance costs of having the other option. That's significant because you have to consider the, uh, the life cycle. With this project, we're just making more capacity to go downstream. That's going to be there basically forever with minor repairs, but repairing tanks, the, all these extra uh, pumps, all those things, the life cycle, eventually having to repair, uh, replace them is way, way more. So that's not even really considered in this. And um, so the, the savings on this plan are, are much, much better. This is kind of a model so how we can do things regionally by, by stopping flow one place and, and allowing more flow another. We can all save money and still have cleaner water. So that's why we, we made that deal. Um, the, the took some convincing Eagle. Eagle doesn't like to, you know, combine things, everything should be a silo, but when you, when you look at it right, we've convinced them that this is the best way to do that. And I think going forward, we will be able to do these kind of deals uh, in the future. So um, that's, that's way why we did it this way, and, and overall, the life of, this, of these facilities, you're gonna save a ton of money. And now when you have the bigger rain event, we're not just filling the tank and then we're done. So the bigger rain event happens, usually it's regional based, not the whole big Guiba system. So probably nine out of 10, and Tim can correct me if I'm wrong, our flow can probably get in a bigger rain event and not be limited anyway. So you're not limited to a tank filling up and then for a small rain event, or they change regulations down the road and say, well now your standard is a different rain event. Now you got tanks that be bigger. This capacity, all that goes away. Most of it. Okay. Yeah. So if I can ask a question. Along those lines of rain events, and we're a year away from, so maybe we're now thought, uh, dried out from last year's rain events that were happening basically the month preceding and you know during June and early July of 21. How would this have handled that kind of situation where we had 100, 500 year rains That's every day for 30 years? Yeah, right, he's, he's the engineer. <laughs> he's the modeler, the modeler. So yeah. all of this is, is matched up with uh, a hypothetical event, right? So the, the hypothetical event that we look at for, for most of the work is the 10 year one hour event. That's an event that has a 10% chance of occurring in any year and lasts for an hour. So that, that's the standard we have to live to. We also look at real world events to see how we'll perform. And what we see is for, for these large, long duration or, or multi-peak events, this is gonna perform really well. It's gonna move the flow out. So last year's event, it, it would have been able to handle that flow and, and move it out of the system uh, without a problem. It would have handled it 100 percent or wouldn't have been I don't, I don't think we would oh. predict any any overflow for that event even with the back-to-back -back events yeah so but i mean there's always one sure there's always one but i mean those, we can't. <laughs> those were significant those were 500 yeah those aren't back-to-back -back 10. those, 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 were, those significant, were significant but yeah in, in every environment in the flow rates that were generated from that event we would have been able to pass with this project keep in mind this is just straight sanitary it's not combined so it does get in there, filtrate through like weeping tiles and some maybe interconnections that haven't been right. found yet, but it's made. So well, this is just sanitary. Not combined. Okay. Right. Um, so I, I think this was discussed earlier. If there's, you know, uh, funding sources, other funding sources. So as uh, uh, Christian had mentioned, there's a five million grant that uh, you've applied for and waiting to hear. Um, also, um, this was submitted under the state revolving fund. Uh, to get a loan from the state. Uh, this was submitted May 31st um, and waiting to hear. There's supposed to be hopefully some uh, principal forgiveness. Right, not, not only a loan, but the state has indicated yeah. that that's how they're gonna administer all the funds they get from the federal government. They have this program already. Instead of standing up another program, you had to apply to the SRF program to get the grant money. So. The principal yeah. forgiveness. Yes, the principal. Yeah. And I think the eligible list is coming out in the fall, so we'll know where we stand in the fall on that one. And going forward, I think the criteria is going to change for disadvantaged communities, where right now the current one that I think that we're in, it's really for ones with consent orders. So I think we have a better shot of getting this one now at this point in time than the future money that's going to come that everybody's kind of clamoring about. Okay. So I, I, this was also asked earlier, what is uh, your share? So uh, Bloomfield's share of the current estimate is $12,555,000. Um, if we do an SRF loan, um, 
Right now, last year, the, the interest rate was 1.875. We don't know where it's gonna be this year. They haven't announced it yet. But if it's that, um, that is uh, your average annual payment would be. Uh, we also looked at it for you guys under a 20 year bond and a 30 year bond with the current interest rates, just to give you an idea where it would fall. And, and how is our share <coughs> determined? Pardon? How is our share determined? So uh, years ago now, the, the communities participated in a, a series of workshops to develop a cost allocation method that they could all agree to. And what they landed on was, it's, it's a mouthful, we call it by tributary area design event peak. So we take that, that hypothetical storm, we say what peak is each area uh, predicted to generate, and then we split it up by that. So it, it's basically your, your storm, storm water, not storm water, storm event peak for, for the sanitary system. How often is that updated, considering a lot of community, ours is built out, so we don't have a lot of change, but a lot of the communities you're looking at, they have significant growth. Yeah, so they it, have significant it, output differences. Yeah, in, in Evergreen Farmington, it, it's, it's received some small updates. Even Bluefield Township has had some, some building where you, know, you, you redevelop a, a parcel. But largely, the Evergreen Farmington communities are pretty well built out. Uh, some of those communities, straddle other systems like uh, West Bloomfield and Clinton, Oakland as well, and they may be building there, but not so much in Evergreen Farmington. So it was last updated in 2018, I believe, but uh, we, we've held those allocations pretty well static since then, uh, partially in fairness, right? Where if, if uh, a community uh, manages to diminish their part of the peak with you know new pipe or something like that, other communities, they end up having a relatively larger portion. So the communities really wanted to lock that in at one point and, and not really continue to update it and have a moving target of what their share was. So those shares have been locked in and actually they are uh, part of that 471 agreement now that, that went out last year. And it goes back to prior, prior projects, like probably 10 years. Wayne Dominey from the town has just been involved, Olivia. We have meetings every quarter is for every in Farmington for updates and this stuff, but there was actually more workshops on top of that, I think, to iron out. Um, I think when Sue Coffey, right, the yeah, WEWA director, she was our manager then, working with the townships and every in Farmington and cities uh, to kind of nail down those and have a fair uh, system allocation. I, I think we looked at uh, maybe a dozen different methods. Every, every method any, any community wanted to look at, we, we explored it, and then collectively the communities found this to be and got consensus of the group to go forward with the way that we landed on. Even if one of the, there's, for example, a possible large development right at one of our borders that would be possibly 150 to 200 homes, or at least apartment homes, that you're saying wouldn't affect the output of that community? Right, so it, it would affect their dry weather flow, certainly. Okay. But we're talking about peak. Uh, you know, peak flow. So okay. like Sid was describing, you know, even though it's a sanitary system, that takes domestic wastewater on a dry day, it does get rainwater in uh, through you know, footing drains and, and other, other sources. So you build a new development with a, a 150 or 200 homes and your dry weather flow will increase slightly, but it will really not have much of an effect on your wet weather flow. Because it's gonna have sump pumps, it won't have weeping tiles, so your, actually your older community have more of a peak factor because the weeping tiles connected, pre-68. 1968 is when the, it was a it was a it was a provision carried forward from Detroit where everything was combined so it didn't matter if the weeping time went there or not I used to be a plumber for became an engineer so I've worked on these things for decades as a kid and coming up but and then as it progressed onto the suburbs they didn't change the code we were on Detroit building code until the state got their own code and then you know the weeping still came in but our system was supposed to be separated and it was kind of a an oversight between engineering and building building code not matching up and then in 68 I think the Bloomfield um, Orchard Subdivision in Auburn Hills was the last one to be allowed never in Farmington, if I'm right, to have weeping towels connected. I lived there for seven years actually in that subdivision. And uh, Auburn Hills separated right when I moved out of there. So that's, that's one piece of Auburn Hills with the old corner up like in South Boulevard. Right. And every in Farmington, the rest is on Clinton, Oakland. So really the older ones have a bigger peaking factor than the new stuff as Tim, Tim mentioned. Right, and you know, just construction materials. Some older pipes are open joint clay pipe just butted against each other. The newer pipes are all 
gasketed plastic pipe. They don't they don't get as much rainwater in them. So or they're glued. Or yeah, even, yeah. even glued or fused. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. Michael. Um, <coughs> You, if I heard you correctly, you're going to know about the state revolving fund this fall, right? Okay. And then the 20-year bond, the 30-year bond, do we bond it? Do you bond it? How does we, that work? we bond it with the county's AAA bond rating. Yep. And, uh, and so we, we kind of push our bonding council to have two offerings to, to say, hey, you know, we, this is a hard pill to swallow, this problem, you know, it's really kind of no one's fault, kind of raised up all this money. What can we do for our community members to kind of make the path that a little bit better besides getting grant money and so we looked at a 30-year bond and so the idea is to be you know to offer it 20 years and 30 so you could beat it in both so we had to push our bond council to get there with the tickets are right I think they're there um, but when you look at it it's really not that big of a difference and you pay a lot more interest over time. right so you're so just so I make sure I understand you correctly you're saying that you're gonna give us as the community the choice between a 20 year or a 30 year. Yeah, but if you go SRF, you're out. Uh, SRF doesn't go 30, so if you go SRF. So, right, we're, trying to, so we're, gonna, we're trying to write the resolutions. Our bond council is working that right now to be right. kind of cafeteria plan. They have all encompassing. Okay. In but if you. Full prepayment. Right? Yes. That, yeah, yeah there's, on there too. Right, there's prepayment also to get rid of the interest cost. Are, you know, are that, there any additional happen. fees or anything since we're both AAA? Are there, w is it the same as if we would have done ourselves? You're not adding any other fees or anything on top where it would be better for us going around? Um, I wouldn't think so. I'm mean, going to ask your financial manager, advisor that one. I wouldn't think so. So it isn't like we're getting it plus a, plus a fee? No, Meaning no, you're not passing on any extra fees to us? No. Okay. We no. Pay, we pay what we so pay. it would be the same as if we Yeah, yeah there's nothing to I mean, yeah. think it would be better to go through them. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, um, and then my other question, I don't know the- If I just ask one, add one more thing. Yeah. With the, I think it's, we get the same bond rating, you know, maybe, but with ours, you get the county full faith and credit pledge behind it, so maybe the interest gets a little better. SRF, it won't matter whether you will go SRF if Perfect. we're going there, but if we're, in the, if we're all in SRF, if principal givenness comes, it'll come through that. So if we're another two sides on you know, the 20, 30 year, there's no principal forgiveness if it comes, those other ones, so. So hopefully we'll know when the SRF makes their determination of where we'll be at. You know, then we can then if it's favorable, we'll probably all be in S sorry, in SRF. Did the same thing yeah, you Commissioner knocked the <laughs> thing up too. Okay. So yeah, if there's lots of principal forgiveness, then it makes more sense to go with the SRF. But with that you get a bunch of strings. There's Davis Bacon, prevailing wage, you know, pro program or a project plan. And then inherently I I've done hundreds of millions of dollars with SRF. They, they tell you, they give you the full loan amount, and once you start doing your draw request, you only get the money at once, right? It's, you have to, it's a reimbursement loan. And you'll turn in a draw request for five million, and it'll come back at like 4.5, and they'll say, oh, we determined these $500,000 are ineligible. Well, if you only have SRF money in play, then you're, you're short 500,000. So even with SRF, I've always cautioned to make sure that we have other money because they come up and get you on that. I've learned it the hard way over the years. It's very frustrating. <laughs> Interesting. Maybe Olivia has had that too. I, I don't know, but. Um. Okay. And, and there's there is. We uh, apply. Uh, uh, we just never laundry, get one. Uh, <laughs> laundry. There's there's project managers that are good and ones that are problematic, and the one that's kind of troublesome. This is a guy for our region. He does this whole entire region. Uh -huh. So he's really a stickler by the, by the rules and he'll take you to task and he'll short the, the money. I hate to say it, but he's really tough to work with. <laughs> tough to work with. I expect that to happen. Um, do you have more, Michael? Yeah, I do. So last fall when we um, agreed to, to the 471 agreement and make a Chapter 20 drain, is that really separate from the capital uh, CAP? Is it totally separate discussion? Like we did, well, if we did if we did not make any chapter 20 we'd still have to do the cap is that correct that that's yes. true Oregon Farmington was on the hook to do this project with or without that that dream okay I guess I guess what I'm trying to just understand is you know when we when we made the decision to move to chapter 20 we were looking at a seven million dollar uh, bogey and now we're talking about almost 13 million dollars um, but I just want to make sure that I'm clear that regardless of whether or not we 
you know, this needed to happen anyway, we would have been on the hook for it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Regardless of whether it went chapter 20 or not. And then on top of that, you have your own consent order that we just, that we're fixing as a region. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't participate in this, you had to do it on your own. And it was way, okay. and those were looked at way in the past. And I think it was way more money at the, at the local level to do the regional bigger solution. And Livia. Sure. <laughs> Um, in, in the phase one projects, uh, which occurred in 2013, 12, 11, 13, 14, 15, um, the, instead of the um, agreement that was brought to the board a year ago, a different form of an agreement was presented for those projects. So we would still be here making the same requests. It would actually be a four, uh, Act 342, Act 342 <laughs> agreement. <laughs> yep. So, so different, um, uh, different public act, but we'd still have a formal agreement uh, for these projects. In this case, it's just converting the uh, the Evergreen Farming to an, to a Chapter 20 drain. That project, we would still be requesting. There still would have been a request for an agreement from the Board of Trustees for the same project. So, no, so we'd still be on the hook for the same amount. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And then what the drain district does is sometimes the state of Michigan gets a little tricky with doling out grant money and low interest loans because prior to it being a drain, they deem that as all a county system. They say, oh, the Clinton Oakland, the Huron Rouge, the Evergreen Farmington, that's a, that's a 342 county system. And we're gonna give principal forgiveness to one entity, the county, take a pick which one you want. So when we convert these to drains, they're separate legal entities so they stand alone for the county. So you're better poised to get grant money from the state and other places when you start limiting it because it's not just system-wide. So this is the county and they're gonna, you know, just pick a certain one. So now you stand alone, have way better opportunities of getting grant money and principal forgiveness, yes. being a drain than, than the old way. Right, okay. And Olivia, I'm blanking on it, I don't know. Just um, Sewer debt, <coughs> does that get, allocated by meter size? Yes, sewer debt is by is included in the MEU charge. Okay. Um, so that is that is what would be affected anytime um, we have bond debt, principal and forgiveness is included in the MEU charge. Right. So in other in the room. You, you want an estimate? Mm -hmm. Like forty bucks. <coughs> did, I, did I calculate it right? Well, it would vary depending on the meter size. Right, um, for MEU. Yeah, so per, well, I got a sticky note here with it because I knew somebody was gonna ask that question. Um, no, um, let's see. right on the front <laughs> so for instance my estimate using this number is that anyone with a three-quarter inch to five-eighths inch meter would pay close to forty five dollars per year per per year and um, and then it would go up from there based on the MEU calculations did you use the SRF number or for the cost I actually assumed a little bit less. I assumed 700,000, so that's why I estimate about $45. Okay. But, but that would be per year, not per, per year. quarter. Per qu it's a quarter charge. Because right now, for a sewer. Not per quarter, but the, the number you gave is per year. So it'd be $10 a quarter, roughly. Well, no, but that would be the uh, sewer MEU charge per quarter would be. Dollars. It, in total for all of our sewer debt. Oh, wow. All of our sewer debt would go, right now it's 37.27 for a sewer only eight in, uh, 5 eighths inch or 3 quarter inch meter per quarter. It would go to about $45 per quarter. About $8 about more. $8, yes. a eight bucks a quarter. Yes. So it's $32 yes. a year, right? So I, I, I used the 883 number and then came up with about 40 bucks for one MEU, which would be a 1 inch meter. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Ooh. Uh. Do you have more? Uh, I, not for the slide. Okay. <laughs> we're done unless you guys have questions for us. No, we're just waiting for the next round of bad news. Yeah. Uh. <laughs>
<laughs> Raphael's here for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for coming Thank to tell you. us about this. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you don't get to go very far because we have you up next too <laughs> on the uh, presentation of the Highland Park bad debt. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was the easy one. Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, I'm just quick introduction. As you are aware, a hot topic in the news lately has been the Highland Park uh, bad debt and how it's allocated back into the system. Uh, the township is not a customer, a direct customer of GLWA. We're a customer for sewer to Oakland County, and then we're a customer to Sakwa for water. Um, our water uh, is Sakwa, but just for tonight here is the Evergreen Farmington and Commissioner Nash. Okay, um, so first of all, in, the, on the, in terms of what, what they owe, it's about 80% on the sewer side and only about 20% on the water. So uh, the South Oakland Water Authority, I mean, it's, it's, their part of it is not gonna be very much. It's, it's more the, uh, the, service, uh, the sewer service um, systems that are gonna be hit by that, um, or have been in the past, I should say. Um, so this has been an ongoing thing since 2012, uh, right after the election, before the new governor came in. Uh, Eagle shut down, um, then DEQ shut down the, uh, the tr water treatment plant in uh, Highland Park because it was, putting out bad water, it was contaminated water, and they said it should just take a while, we'd like Great Lakes Water Authority to very temporarily give them water, and 10 years later they're still taking it. So um, last year, they, uh, up until last year, they had paid some. Some years they paid quite a bit, some years they didn't pay much, last year they didn't pay anything towards anything. That's where it kind of came to a head when the uh, Great Lakes Water Authority came to us and came to the customers and said, um, because of this extra money that, that they're not paying, you're gonna have to come up with, they weren't sure at that point, um, it ended up being about $67 million for all the customer communities, which sounds like a lot, but out of a billion dollar system, it's not a huge amount in, you know, per person, but um, it's still not something that's sustainable and it shouldn't be done. Um, so. Coming to a head again, um, several kind of forces kind of developed that pushed this more than it had been in the past. Um, we, we reached out to everybody we could, um, so did Great Lakes, Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, and so we got a response from the governor. Uh, we've been communicating with the state agencies really for the first time since all this started, um, working towards something. So. In terms of court cases, we've had recently um, some fairly non-friendly um, decisions on a, an older case that went from, uh, gosh, 20, 1996 to 2014, I believe, um, that covered that area, and there was a lot of confusion around that. And there was also another case that was started um, between 2014 and 2021 um, that had many, uh, much more positive decisions for the Great Lakes Water Authority and the customer communities. Um, so right now, this second lawsuit ordered the, uh, the city of Highland Park to um, send money that they had collected, 65% of all the funding they had collected from their customers to the Great Lakes Water Authority to pay for that, for what they owed which wasn't a whole lot um, compared to what they owed. It's about 52 million. Uh, Raphael can come with better stats than that. Um, that. That is owed. So um, this year, uh, one of the things that the legislature did was they authorized $25 million for the Great Lakes Water Authority out of that Ar ARPA money right away. And through that and this other funding coming in, um, Great Lakes Water Authority decided to not charge on the rates for this year's water. That 67 million won't be charged to the communities. Your, your rates were reduced um, appro appropriately for that, um, which is a good thing. And, and then that's a definite step in the right direction that we haven't seen before. So with, with the, the, the better court decisions, um, Right now, Great Lakes Water Authority has entered into mediation with uh, Highland Park, and the state is helping with that. So again, that's something that has not been there before. 
Um, we want to see this thing settled. We want to see Great Lakes Water Authority not have to pick up this tab. They, great, uh, um, in the long run, Highland Park needs to pay their bills. Um, there is some work that uh, Great Lakes Water needs to do. Um, they've, they're talking about putting in some uh, water meters so they can better meter what water uh, Highland Park gets. There are several unmetered customers, including Detroit, um, that th it's all on estimates. So they, they wanted that to have actual meters and we wanna have that. Highland Park has suggested that the state should buy them a new water plant, 90 to $100 million to serve 10,000 customers. Um, doesn't sound practical to me and I don't think, we would definitely not support that and I don't see Eagle doing that, they're, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, I can't see them spending that kind of money on something like that, because um, they're already hooked up to Detroit water. Why do it again? Um, but we, I think we are in a way, uh, this year's has been canceled, we're gonna be working to get make sure next year's doesn't happen, and we would like to be reimbursed as much as we can get. I, I don't see us getting that from the rate payers in, in a very poor community, um, but I, I, we're gonna be working try to get some of this from the state because the state organized this whole thing and they should have some responsibility for it. So that's my two cents and I'm gonna let um, Raphael finish anything I didn't do. <laughs> you know what, uh, Jim pretty much did my whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just hop through it. Uh, you already went over like you're uh, what they call a second tier customer of Evergreen Farmington Sanitary District. Uh, there you go. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, there are two court cases. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, here's your share. Um, it was 939,000 inclusive of a charge that was dropped for 2023. Um, that's been dropped off, so it's a, it, it was a higher amount than the 939. Also, I've been doing some uh, more in-depth calculations instead of just using your 2023 share. So, when I get that done, I'll tell you the preliminaries look like you did not contribute that much. Uh, it's coming down as we look at the history of the actual contributions in relationship to the rest of the Evergreen Farmington customers. All right. What do, what do you mean by didn't contribute much? You as need different much. numbers than these then, because these are yeah. significant. Well, it's still significant, but not as significant. Because your share this year is a certain percentage, all right? Over time, I think, in relationship to the overall total Evergreen Farmington system, your share has increased over time. Probably to because- To be clear though, for, for somebody else, paying a dollar for anybody else that isn't us is significant. Well, paying $930,000 <laughs> is significant. No, no, it's significant. I'm not trying to underplay the significance. This is somebody else's bill that we're stuck with right That's now. correct. Okay. Have we actually paid that? Like I said, I'm working on a refined cut calculation, but Based on the 2023 share, yes, that's what it would be the answer. But that's over time. That's over a long time. Probably a long time. Ten years. Uh, ten o years. Over 10 years. Okay. Yeah. It's almost on. But most of it's um, less than 10 years. They weren't charging that much on the, the much older stuff. So it's been more prevalent in the, in the more current years. All right, so there's, like Jim said, there's two, two major cases. There's the 2014 that takes care of everything from two th 2014 back, and the 2020 case that's related to everything from 2014 forward. Uh, the 2014 case had a ruling that kind of favored Highland Park, and then Highland Park said, well, based on that ruling, we think we owe even less. So now GLWA is appealing that ruling um, 2020 case, the judge said, hey, Highland Park, pay up. Um, and of course, Highland Park is appealing that one, so. Which court is it in? Uh, I know the. The Wayne County Circuit. Uh, it's Wayne Please County, sir. yeah. And this, the 14 one keeps <coughs> bouncing back and forth. Uh, 2020 is just at the circuit level right now. So I'm sure it's gonna get peeled up to the higher levels, see what happens. That's it. Um, if you have any other questions, just let me know. I would love to get an update from the meeting that we set up with everybody. Um, so as, as one of the many communities that is being forced to pay for stuff that we shouldn't be paying for, 
uh, we kept hearing the frustration of, well, we're dealing with it in the courts or state won't talk to us, let's write letters. And letters don't always go anywhere and we all saw that it didn't. Um, so I stalked the state budget director at a, an event here in Bloomfield and set up a, a meeting with Gliwa, Sakwa, W. I mean, it literally took me less than 10 minutes to accomplish something that should have taken a, a long time ago, it should have happened. They had a meeting and they promised that they were meeting again. Has there been a meeting since? Because nothing, it sounds like nothing's changed, but the state was willing to participate in possibly funding and opening those discussions. Has there been another meeting since? Or do I need to set another one up? And uh, the executive, <laughs> the county executive and some other folks and Gliwa and Treasury and somebody else from the state, gosh. Was that the Three the? Years ago. I wasn't at that meeting, but. But that yeah, you weren't on the Zoom one. Um, I feel like you looked familiar. Somebody from there was only one person from WRC, and she checked out early. Carrie Cox. Carrie Cox. Uh, Carrie no, Cox. Carrie was on the whole but time. But Ann Barra attended. Oh, yeah, Anne. yeah, okay. the yeah, deputy. She checked out early. So deputy. Carrie was the um, was the one on there the whole time. But the chief deputy had to get off when it was time for WRC to get to talk. So we we were supposed to have them meet with all of you again because the state was supposed to. That was the Zoom remember. that we set, that and Olivia and I set up. I don't know if they have. I, I'd have to yeah, talk to Carrie. Carrie is the one that really does all our okay. regional stuff. So, so she's I'll reach. She's informed of all these, and um, I'd have to talk to her again. But I, I remember she said they were going to. They were supposed to. So I just assumed that maybe they reached out to all of you and like cut out the middleman because we were the middleman. But it looks like I'll set up another meeting for you because they shouldn't be snaking out on this. And the state, whether it's left or right, whoever's been running it for the last 10 years, they need to come to the table. So if need be, we'll set up another one for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's frustrating from your end too. I know yeah. everyone was really surprised that they sounded surprised that this was still an issue. Sure. And we were like, how could you be surprised by this? It's been going <laughs> on for 10 years. Right. Uh, and part of that is there's a changeover with administrations. And so they did seem open to talking about it, but it, it just looks like they need a little more of a push. So we'll help push that for you. <laughs> and I think over the years, Commissioner, we had updates that the courts weren't doing their job. The courts just kicking the can down the road, not right. want, not wanting to make rulings. So that well, was happening. Well, this latest right. one, that one we're having, we're waiting on the appeal. That's the Supreme Court, and that, that's been almost a year waiting on appeal. So I mean, right. it's these things are for you. nothing's fast when you're in court. I'm sure right. you know that. So, right. Right. Um, Commissioner, I really appreciate. I think a week or two ago, you had a. Uh, Zoom program where you had a lot of communities and uh, yeah. the supervisor and I and the clerk and, and, and some of our other staff participated in that. And I was pleased to hear that uh, Judge Rosen is, uh, is he, w w did that mediate, is run, is heading the mediation? And I think that was, was that supposed to be this week or last week? I knew it was coming soon, but I, I really couldn't tell you exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, he, he's and very good and, and we, we have, uh, we have a lot of faith in him that he'll do, well, I was, do the right thing. I, I was pleased to hear that both, you know, that the state is going to be participating in that because ultimately it seems to me like that's that's got to be the solution. Uh, you know, it, it, what, what's particularly galling, I mean, I, I'm the treasurer, I get calls from a lot of people who are complaining, and when this hit the press, got a lot more calls about, you know, I have enough difficulty paying for my own bills, let alone someone else's bill. Um, and then on top of it, to know that they weren't paying and yet they were still collecting. And that is, was just, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, oh, um, but that is the most galling thing. And I, and I just hope that you know, they're, they're able to um, put some transparency and some focus on what they're doing with their money um, that they've been collecting and not paying. So th we're going to make sure, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that happens. And that's why I love, I like doing those kind of events because it really makes sure everybody's on the same page. And, and um, it, it's, I appreciate you being part of that. And, uh, if we have to, we'll do it again. But anytime we have these kind of things come up, we, we like to do those kind of things. We'd love to have you be part of it. Thank you. Uh, so if, if they end up paying, whether through a court action or through mediation or the state steps in, is it possible that we're going to get reimbursed? Hmm. You know, we're going to work. We spent almost a million dollars coming. And it's you know. hard to say. It's, it's going back in time makes it harder. But um, again, I, I think the, the state has a lot of responsibility, so we're gonna, we're gonna keep on them. And I think those letters really did happen, and, and the, the more press that went out around this, it really left them no choice. They realized they had to do something about it, so that's when the governor stepped in, I think, and I think uh, 
And I think we've communicated more since that time than, than in the whole, t you know, almost 10 years ten before years. that. So it's good. good. But it, it's interesting that if they find in, you know, for Highland Park to pay, but Highland Park doesn't have the money, us getting reimbursed seems like. That's the thing. I, I, I don't want to hit their rate. They are collecting. They're, they're what Brian has said is they're collecting issue. money. So what are they doing with it? Well, right. They're taking money from the residents. Well, and right. What are they doing with it? It's also why it's good that the state Well, they do have their own the systems table. to run right. internally. But I, I know it's it's just not been, it, it's been just that rough feeling about it the whole to time. To not I even mean. put any payment in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And making some kind of a reasonable effort to contribute to it. Um, but uh, no, I thank you all for coming in. It's very helpful. Hopefully, uh, you know, if necessary, you'll come back again because it's very important that we're obviously we're not the only community where we're hearing from our residents who are very unhappy about us contributing to Highland Park or any community for their uh, the payments they should be making. Um, and so, you know, I'm I'm less concerned at this point as far as what caused all that. I think that's something that the courts are going and courts mediation, maybe Wayne County and the state will get involved with and I and I hope Wayne County is involved. I'm not sure is Well they have been. They've uh, been in those meetings too. Okay. And but as far as the uh, remediation of all of this, I, personally I think the only solution is to have the state uh, get seriously involved because it's not going to happen other than putting pressure from your department, from us and other communities. But the state really is the one who has the authority through all the various agencies and departments and has the resources um, to find a solution to this and to make everybody whole. And I mean us, not us, the other communities. Um, and help, you know, Highland Park out. Certainly not, nobody wants to take the water away from them, but they obviously need some assistance, whether it's uh, somebody to run their system, to help them as an emergency water manager, resource manager, whatever it is. The state needs to take some responsibility and do something to help, because to help all these communities, because when you look at it, um, it's, like, it's like a big umbrella, that, and they're the only ones who are large enough to put all this together and deal with all of the issues. It, having a piecemeal between Wayne County, Oakland County, all the different communities, it's just going to make it very difficult to get to a, no, I got a solution. I understand. Okay. But thank you for coming in. I do appreciate it. Anyone all have any other day. questions? Or? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, folks. Just, right. Appreciate thank it. You. I said just a couple of acknowledgments, if I yeah. could. One is Commissioner Nash. You know he. He's a great guy to work for. He reaches pers across party lines all the time to come up with regional solutions when people don't think it happen. He at least tries. I watched him when we had to water the project. Eight two people didn't have water and on a tunnel job. We had to water their wells. Mr. National gave his cell phone numbers and you know this is a great couple of gems in the room. This is one of them. But the other one's Raphael Tirola. He used to work for DWSD and we're fortunate to have him. So he advocates on behalf of all our community members, including township and everybody he knows all the skeletons are buried <laughs> with cleva and he holds them accountable you know anytime he can karen stickles another one and this team back here but what a real great one is olivia olivia <laughs> attends all our meetings when she can she volunteers for extra work as a chairperson and steer on our steering committees all that well just a couple couple of others that really kind of drive the system but she's one of the go-to people that we have in our urban farming system, and uh, you have a gem here with the, with Olivia. Yeah, if you do. don't already know that, I'll just we know, know, that. know that. We know how yeah. great she is. We know yes, that. Thank, thank you. Thank it's you. nice thank to you. hear thank you. Thank you, thank you Commissioner. Thank, thank you, everybody. All right. So next, we'll go on to uh, considering the award of the 2022 Retaining Wall Program uh, contract for the uh, Jan Roncelli Safety Pack Program. I will say it's it's. Um, I've been here long enough with the township that when we have these meetings with Evergreen Farmington and the steering committees that Sid was mentioning, um, we're at the point now where there's like just a couple of us in the room who've been here more than 10 years and <laughs> we kind of, it's, it's a weird feeling. <laughs> at one time. <laughs> now you know how Wayne used to feel. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> 
Hello. All right. So changing gears uh, tonight, I'm here for the 2022 retaining wall repair program. Um, and as part of the safety path program over the years, uh, retaining walls have, be, have been constructed um, to get the path completed. Um, wherever it's needed, uh, retaining walls are used for uh, steep grade changes in elevation. Um, they're used to make sure we stay in the right of way and we don't have to get an easement from property owners so we can make transitions. Um, and like the concrete of our safety paths uh, needs to be repaired, we also need to address our retaining walls. Um, and so this year, uh, my staff identified 13 locations uh, throughout the township where the retaining wall, part of the retaining wall or the whole retaining wall uh, needs some um, repair. Or in some cases, we can remove it um, due to, it, it, sometimes retaining walls are installed to accommodate a tree that's close to the right-of-way line. We don't want to disrupt the root system. Well, 15 years ago, the tree was there. It's not there anymore. So now we look at these, can we even remove some of them? Um, so we did that in uh, a repair, retaining wall repair program two years ago. We did not want have one last year. So we have one this year with the 13 locations. And this is just a map. So this is one map. They were just on two different maps, so they didn't get too, too crowded. And then the colorful dots are just the approximate locations of where the 13 locations are. Um, so we did take bids, uh, but I do want to say in the budget presented to the board for the safety path, um, the number was 150000 for this program. When we put the budget together, we didn't have the 13 locations, and we didn't have the engineering breakdown of it. Um, so the safety path budget had 150000 for this, but these 13 locations is significantly more than what was budgeted. Um, and in this case, um, we did take bids. Only one bid was submitted, which seems to be a reoccurring theme lately. As Sid referenced, things are getting tough and uh, su supply is uh, low and demand is high. So we had one bid that was submitted. Um, fortunately for us, it was Italia, who, uh, who is, uh, uh, has done a lot of work with the township. So it was a contractor that we worked with in the past, were aware of, um, and also the bid was less than the engineer's estimate, which is always a, a good sign. Um, so in this case, uh, the bid from Italia that we received was in the amount of $621,700.25. Um, and then as, as we've been doing in the past was the suggested motion including that the township uh, EESD shall have the authority to approve up to a 10% increase to the contract based on actual quantities needed to complete the project or conditions discovered in the field, and those would all be reviewed by the EESD and uh, the township's consulting engineers. We have HRC on site when the contractor is working, measuring quantities, and tracking all the information. Um, I do want to say that I did talk to Jason about this project, especially since we estimated 150,000. Um, the approved budget, the overall budget for the safety path program, it was uh, for almost $4.9 million, and this included an expense of $1.7 million for construction of the portion of the path as part of the TAP grant. Um, you'll find out later in the two presentations from now that the TAP grant will, will not, that, that path will not be constructed this year. So there is no need at this time to do a budget amendment because we do have the, the, the overall safety path has the, a budget for this. Any questions? I look for a motion. So moved. Moved by Trustee Barnett. Support. Support by Trustee Shostak. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. So next we'll consider the 2022 Jan Rancelli Safety Path Repair Program with additional funding. Okay, I do not have a presentation for this one. Um, so like I said earlier, every year um, the township staff uh, goes and looks at repairs of the existing safety path system, the concrete repairs, and then also our residents are one of our best uh, sources of information uh, because they use the path so we don't 
We don't take staff to walk paths all day, um, which would be lovely, but that doesn't happen. So residents are a good resource as well for sections of path that need to be replaced. Um, back in 2020, the uh, township took bids for the repair program and included in that was cost uh, unit prices for 2021 and 2022. The contract in 2020 was awarded to JB contractors. Uh, they performed the work that met uh, township satisfaction and the motion from the board included um, ex extending that contract through a change order. Uh, and the board did approve the unit prices for uh, 2021 and 2022 that JB contractors had included in the bid. Uh, uh, likewise, for budget purposes, uh, I used $200,000, but based on the repairs that are needed, um, the, the scope of the repairs and also the unit prices uh, that were in the contract for 2020 for the 2022 work from JB contractors, uh, it's estimated that the change order for the current repair locations we have would be $258,029.20. Um, however, um, I'm requesting that the Board of Trustees approve the expenditure of $290,000 for the 2022 Jan Ron Selly Safety Path Program. Um, it's $90,000 above what was included in the budget for Safety Path. Um, and also um, still above the estimate or the, ch the change order that we would issue for the known repair locations. Um, and the reason why I'm requesting a, a, a higher amount is because we do get throughout the season residents reporting other locations. And if we have a contractor who is out working in the field, I'd like to be able to add those repair locations rather than put them off for another year, especially if the contractor's working. There will come a time where if we don't have a contractor on site, um, you know, construction season's coming to an end where we might not be able to address the repairs that this construction year, but we do have a couple, you know, several months left of the construction season. Um, and also, um, again, like I said, the budget amount I used was 200000 for what was presented to the board, um, but the overall safety path fund is just over $4.8 million, and since we won't be constructing uh, part of the path this year, we, we don't have to do a budget amendment. Anybody have any questions? Um, I have a question. Olivia and I have talked a little bit about this that I'll notice when I, I walk paths. Um, that there'll be markings and so I talked to Olivia and said you know what does this mean some of these squares have issues some really don't and what you explained to me last year was that they, there's a cursory look and then a second look because sometimes they heave and then sometimes they rest and you know there's like a first look and a second look and um, the other thing we talked about was one particular area on Inkster where um, there was some issues with trees and with the split rails because it was raised but then when it flattens out that is newer um, safety path. But if, like, how is it that they chose to go through and they took out, I don't know, five or six squares that had tiny imperfections and in taking them out, they caused like a similar chip to the one next to it, very unfortunate. Whereas if they had, instead of going further north on Inkster, if they'd gone south on Inkster, they would have encountered um, what isn't even a safety path. It was a, um, a sidewalk to the school you know, from back before we even lived here, before mm -hmm. the safety path program was invented. And it's falling and cracking and huge cracks and, you know, it's not ADA and I, I don't understand the logic or the process where they came back and approved to take out really perfectly good squares. And unfortunately they chipped the one next to it, which sort of net gain was nothing, as opposed to how is it that that ancient, ancient path I mean, what is the process? I know you can't walk all the miles. I know there's a ton, but it, you know, newer ones were being evaluated that didn't really need it. Okay. Whereas there was an ancient one adjacent that got overlooked somehow. Well, I, I the, regarding the one that's the school, I would have to look and see if it's part of the township's path or if it was on private property related to the school. There were paths that existed prior to the safety path millage that have been incorporated, but if it was on private property like access, like sometimes schools have uh, like uh, sidewalks from neighborhoods or like cut through neighborhoods and well, stuff. This is not in front of the school. This is um, right along Inkster residential. And they did, there was a couple squares that were really bad. Mm -hmm. And before I could, could get around to telling you, hey, there's this place that's really bad. Um, 
they marked them and they came out and they replaced those. Mm -hmm. And this is in that same, like two houses next to each other. Whereas I just noticed that it's just deteriorating and crumbling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll have to follow up with my staff okay. um, about, you know, just if, if we're looking at here, just look this way too, um, just to make sure that while we're in the area working, we make sure we include sure, that. It just seems scope. like you'd, other than issues with heaving and, and things that are reported, you know, I would think they might want to look towards the age when they're just perusing, mm -hmm. you know, um, where to where to yeah, work. Yeah, age then. is a factor. They will focus on on age as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, might be another reason to have that extra money in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> since if it turns out it's ours. See if things come up. If it's the schools, we don't no, touch no, no, it. It's not on school or property. Or if it's private, but um, we'll definitely. No you know and that's that's the nicer weather people are out and so we definitely want to know about issues that that are out there yeah. um, so we can add them and look if they can be addressed sometimes um, it's a bigger scope it might include drainage issues where we can't accommodate it this season but then we can uh, incorporate it into next year as well well and I had mentioned one some heaving ones on court and two last year and they did come out and they put um, like the temporary asphalting ramps it's it's like a tree in one place the tree is lifting the sidewalk it's unfortunate yeah yeah and we um, will quite go a trip out. hazard yeah we do want to eliminate those trip hazards if we can't fix it we want to temporarily address it by putting the coal patch in or spray paint it so it's noticeable and visible before if especially if there's going to be a delay in the in getting it replaced yeah and and that was done very quickly and the split rail repair when i talked to you about that 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 was done like overnight so thank you any other questions or comments if not, I'd look for a motion. So moved. Motion by Trustee Barnett. Support. Support by Trustee Saki. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, next, we'll go on to the TAP grant for the Telegraph Square Lake Franklin Jan Ronselli Safety Path of Way Acquisition, right of way acquisition. Yeah. So, um, Let's see, about a year ago, uh, we came to the board to give the board an update on the path and through the topographic survey collection and design process, it was identified in order to make this path happen, we needed um, easements for uh, almost every property adjacent to the path. Um, and so we reviewed that information with the trustees. At that time, um, it was discussed the process that's required to go through easement procurement with uh, this being a potential MDOT funded project. Um, and so moving forward from the meeting last year, uh, the appraisal process started and we did give an estimate at that time, but then the appraisal came in. And so now we're here to give an update um, on that to make sure that the board is still interested in proceeding. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Colleen hill Stramzak with HRC to go through the presentation. Thanks, Olivia. Um, I'm just, I only have eight slides, I swear. <laughs> 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 I know you've been here a while and we, we want to keep this quick and we want to answer all your questions. So this is, this is a repeat from before just to remind you of what the project is. So we're doing a six foot wide path and all the blue areas along uh, uh, shown on the map are, are where we're filling in uh, sidewalk uh, safety path. Um, we're going from, uh, I'll start at the, at the southeast and we're heading um, along Square Lake and up Telegraph um, to get to Bloomfield Town Square. We're connecting to that bus stop and we're um, replacing the bus stop pad and then we're crossing the median and crossing over to Baton where we could we pick up another bus stop pad so that people can uh, can access uh, from one side of, of telegraph to the other another crossing that we've been that, that has been um, looked at and discussed for years I, I, I don't know the first time but I remember the first time that Randy Ford came to me and said hey how do we get people across there and I said Oh, as a traffic engineer, that scares me. <laughs> so what we came up with was moving, uh, extending that, that corner um, on the Penske Triangle 
so that we shorten that, that ped crossing distance. So we're coming around the Penske Triangle. We can't get across their driveway on the north side. We tried everything we could. Um, their driveway actually slopes away from the roadway and is at a, a, a too steep a slope for us to cross. So we just couldn't do it. So we're, we're upgrading uh, all the ADA, adding all ADA ramps. We're upgrading and installing PED uh, detection uh, and, and PED signals at the locations necessary. Um, and so we were awarded a TAP grant uh, in 2020 uh, for uh, 2022. And because of right away, we are not gonna make that, uh, that deadline of 2022. And we received an email today requesting us to request an extension. And then it goes through SEMCOG and MDOT's Economic Development Committee. And um, we're, we're hopeful that they'll, they'll extend us to 23 and, um, and give us the, the time to, to finish the right of way acquisition. So this, this is a repeat as well. Um, I highlighted the section, we highlighted the sections in green that we've already, um, uh, we've already completed. So we've determined the fair market value. And as Olivia mentioned, the appraisals came in a little bit higher. At the time we estimated them last year, we, we went with the best information we had from the assessor's office about property values and things like that. So we, we did the best guess and then the real estate market hasn't, you know, dropped off any, especially in Bloomfield Township. So, um, so it, it came in a little bit higher. So not, not as high as some of the other projects that we've seen today. So, um, but so we've, we've gone through the, the title commitments, we've gone through the, the landscaping review. Part of the, the process that took longer was the appraisals because each property owner is given the ability to walk the property that, that is being um, requested an easement or a temporary or permanent and it with, with the appraiser so that they can you know, express any concerns or, um, or issues. And you know, one of them was, well, if we give you this right away, is that is 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 that going to affect our setback? You know, if we decide to to um, install more parking or expand the building or what have you, are we limited? So those are the types of questions that we we got. Um, we've been uh, we've had some uh, pretty detailed discussions with several property owners about drainage and other things. So we've we've gone through that process, but. We haven't been able to, through MDOT's process, we're not able to give them an offer until we have the appraisals back. And so that's where we're at right now. And the, the, the property owners are still able to donate the property, but they, by federal rules, we have to present them the, the, the fair market value. Um, so where are we? We've got 11 properties, uh, one, was uh, acquired through the planning process for the Valvoline uh, parcel. And then um, we've gone through um, the, the appraisal process and we're, the township hasn't approached the property owners with the appraisals because we were over. And there's a, there's a detailed table in your, and, and my next slide gives you the, the summary, but there's a detailed table in the, in the letter we provided. Um, and based on that, we haven't, uh, we, we can't uh, finalize our plans and, and submit um, and, and be obligated um, by MDOT, have our funding obligated by MDOT until we, until we certify the right of way. So based on in uh, August of 2021, we estimated that the 11 properties would be 271,105. And, and when the appraisals came back, we were at 363. So that's an increase of 92,000. As I said, you know, we, we had the best information available in, last year and uh, you know, the real estate market hasn't slowed down, uh, at, least not, at least not around here. So that's where we're at with, um, with the, and this, this shows, uh, as, as Olivia mentioned, just about every parcel needs, needs uh, some sort of easement, whether it's temporary grading easement, we did the best we could to design the path within the, the existing right-of-way, but in places like along uh, Square Lake, 
there was almost no existing right away. The right away was at, almost at the back of the curb. So we did the best we could, but um, there were still there were still impacts. So here's here's what everybody wants to see. This is your, um, and I just want to point out a few things. So the 271 and the 363 in the right of way acquisition column, um, that was on the from the previous slide. Uh, the one thing, the the other thing that changed is during the TAP grant uh, application process, we're not allowed to put in contingencies as a line item. So each of our unit costs for all of all of our construction materials is increased by 10 or 15 percent to account for inflation, pro, uh, you know, uh, uh, cost increases for materials, all of the things that we've seen. Well, we did a really good job apparently because we're, um, we're, we're our, our total construction estimate came in less than what our, what our original construction estimate did last year. Um, and this is based on our final plans. So um, MDOT's, you'll see that MDOT's share went down just a little bit and that's because for the construction share and that's because uh, it's a pro rata it's it's 60 40 so I'm not pay 60% and you pay 40% that might be a little bit better because uh, some cog will pay 80 20 for their share but it's, it's unclear to us at this moment exactly how much so when you when we submit final plans we'll get a final um, Olivia will get a final um, agreement that will that will detail out exactly who's paying what and and how much money um, the township is it is responsible for, but MDOT is covering uh, most of CE, so that's that that's that price didn't change, um, but so that's where we're at with um, with overall uh, costs, and I figure I'll leave this slide up for questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? <clears throat> uh, just so make sure I'm reading this correctly, that our cost is lower than was what was forecast. The total project cost <coughs> will be lower. Yes. Okay. And um, and we have current uh, the our cost estimate before was the average unit prices from MDOT, so that's based on bid tabla bid tabulations, and we've used the most recent ones that available. Yeah, I'm just surprised to see overall it's lower between the property acquisitions were higher and you were talking about the materials were higher and I, I yeah. We had, we had, we had put in, uh, we, we thought we might have to remove, when we, when we put in the grant, we thought we might have to reconstruct the Sugarbush Plaza sign and we were able to, 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 to weave around the back of it and put up a split rail fence behind so that, you know, and a retaining wall to make sure that people are, are safe when they're walking on the path but we had inc we had overestimated just to be safe because you never know what's going to happen when you when you get out there and get detailed grades and look oh, we have to go we have to put a, a, a little tiny retaining wall around that around that uh, uh, fire hydrant if we hadn't you know f so that's that's why we we come in a little bit high yeah we always want our estimates to be high and then then look good when the <laughs> yeah when we so uh, win lose here on this one <laughs> especially when you're especially it when sounded all like bad grants. news that's why I think Michael asked the question too like wait a minute you know like our are, overall are, are, is, is are lower sure? even with all he made it sound like it was going to be like scary to see the final <laughs> cost but at the, like Colleen said at this point um, the township has not submitted those uh, offers yet to any of the property owners and since that par portion of the estimate came back. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that the board wanted to proceed with the, making those offers. That's my recommendation because it's still a benefit to the project. Um, and then in the memo or in the letter that was attached to the memo, it identifies the, indiv the totals, individual properties. So pending the board's um, approval to continue with this process, the next step then would be providing those offers directly to the property owners and Colleen I correct me if I'm wrong but is is there a, a, a an actual form for uh, donation yes yes and that will be provided with every appraisal and uh, good faith uh, offer that we so is on. there any any like 
past idea estimate that you have to offer the um, appraised amount because you're getting the grant money, but do you anticipate some of these property owners may donate or <clears throat> just have to wait and see? I, I think we have to wait and see. Um, township staff has talked with two property owners um, just about their concerns about how the path would be incorporated into their property. Um, so I, I, I don't know where they stand, but you know, of course, it's a, there's an actual process. Uh, it, I guess if you're dealing with the state, there's a form for every process and, and that's part of the hoops we got to jump through uh, versus if we were not using grant funds, but it's still at this point, it's still a benefit to, to move forward. When you're talking, <clears throat> even with easements without grants, when we're going out there, people surprise you. Sometimes they don't want any extra trees thrown in. Sometimes they expect whole new landscape. I mean, you literally don't know what you're going to get until you have the discussion. Um, you know, some of these property owners are township residents, so they understand it affects their taxes. So it's everyone is so different that it'll be interesting to see how it happens. I think we were going in with the expectation of if nobody donates it, this is our worst case scenario. And then if anyone does, it just goes down from there. So I think that's why we were kind of preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. Correct. Brian? T typically, we don't pay for easements because typically we're not using federal grants and we, we may, or state, and we, we may be doing extra landscaping. We may be doing things to um, accommodate and, and help the residents and, and landowners because they are giving up some of their property to do this. And I guess what I'm wondering is in addition, or maybe with the concept of donation, if maybe we can even ask them about landscaping, because quite frankly, I think everyone wins with landscaping, um, the property owner and the community in terms of seeing what's there. I don't want to begrudge anyone their land, but they may also like the opportunity, um, especially if they're getting better rates with the quantity discounts maybe that we can get. Um, so maybe that might be something in part of your uh, discussions just to add. Um, in lieu of or that they would do or we I, I don't know how that works with the grant if maybe we can't do it but maybe there's another way to do it there are certain things that we can and can't do with the with the grant uh, with it, it's really just the federal process right. um, but uh, what we have done is any any areas that we're substantially impacting landscaping we've included that in the you know the the appraisals we've included a landscaping budget in there so that if they do accept the the offer then they're getting paid back so that their contractor or their staff can do the 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 landscaping as opposed to MDOT's contractor doing the landscaping okay. we are putting sod back any place that we're touching grass so that we're making sure that we're keeping up the aesthetic it's you know so to Brian's point though is there an option for if somebody if you say let's say somebody doesn't have anything in the front it's mm -hmm. just empty there's a couple of those that there's little to nothing and, and can we say you know you can take this as a cash offer or we can put in this kind of landscaping which they're getting their value but a little prettier is that where you're kind of going with that yeah. or somehow are you allowed to offer <clears throat> that way I, I don't think so <laughs> typically no so so in the past you could That's say in, like in the, the past idea, you could, yeah. they, they've <laughs> changed they've changed some of those rules in the past you you would say oh well we'll give you a sewer lead and and you'll donate the property and that's not allowed anymore it, it has to go through two separate processes so okay. it, it's just it, they want to make sure that everything's above board yeah. and fine. some that's some some other people are not you know uh, you know I'm sure that somebody's gamed the system before and caused issues. So I, I do like um, Treasure Keep's idea, though, that you know putting in the safety path is great, but you know if we could add a little landscaping to it. Um, just to yeah, make and, it and more we do for if we for our own safety path um, when we need an easement. Um, Treasure Keeps is correct. I, I can only think of one since I've been here where there was a, a monetary exchange for the land, or for the right of way, because we don't purchase the land. But in other cases, it's okay, we need this piece of land and we can add some uh, arborvitaes or trees to provide screening now that you don't have that natural buffer. Um, that's usually how we can incorporate landscaping um, especially because it is changing the property 
um, where maybe they had screening, they had natural vegetation, and before, before and now we had to remove the 20 years of natural vegetation so we can replace it. You can't replace same with same, but we can replace screening. Uh, and we can add things to the project to that effect, but it's not a trade uh, offer anymore. It's a, it's a we're going to make these accommodations, but it's not with the uh, assumption that they're going to donate. We, we can't do that with federal money, so. Anyone else have any other questions? We'll push it to the limits, but. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no more questions, I'd look for a motion. I'll make a motion. And it was the, the recommendation. You just want to know if we want to go forward with it? Proceed with the uh, appraisal estimate uh, or the appraisal of 363,854. Can you go back? Motion by Trustee mm -hmm. Murray. Support. Support by Trustee Fakie. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. All right. Thank you. So um, we'll move forward and um, eventually I'll be back with the formal grant agreement because <laughs> as Colleen said, we still don't have a formal grant agreement. This is a new process. We haven't got, we haven't used this uh, process before, these grant funds. Um, so it's a little interesting that you have to do a lot of the design work and all this work ahead of time before there's an agreement. But if we did fund this project on our own, we would still be going through this process of easement procurement. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have uh, payroll and vouchers for July 11th. We've had a chance to look them over. If there's no changes, I'd look for a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Trustee Murray. Support. Support by Trustee Barnett. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Right now we're missing our normal motion. I'll maker. help them out. So All right. I'll make that, I'll make that <laughs> motion motion, yeah. motion by Trustee uh, Barnett. Support. Support by Treasurer Keeps. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That does pass. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in a couple weeks.